Hi, welcome to the next video about sorting. And before we get into the last topic of this unit, which is some exciting, really totally different things about what are the limits of sorting, I want to cover some of the extra details around merge sort and divide and conquer algorithms to make sure we're all kind of comfortable and feeling good about this. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is something a lot of us looked at today in class. And in case you didn't, the, I, the question here is, we've seen this divide and conquer algorithm to sort, which is merge sort. Uh, we also talked about how um, binary search is also kind of a divide and conquer algorithm for searching in a sorted list. Uh, what's another problem? So what's a new problem that we can try to apply this magical technique to? Well, what about max? So you're given a list A and you want to find the largest thing in that list. We know that we could just write a for loop and, and search through until we see the largest thing, but um, what about a divide and conquer approach? Could that be better? Well, let's think about it. If you haven't thought about this before, pause and take a second to think. Otherwise, I'll just remind you of what we came up with in class today. It's probably some algorithm like this. So this is very similar to merge sort. Why is it a divide and conquer algorithm? Well, remember, divide and conquer is kind of three things. So there's the divide part. And a key aspect of a good divide and conquer algorithm is that you want to divide into even equal parts, as equal as you can get. Then we have a recurse. There should really call it divide and recurse and conquer. Um, so recursive calls need to be part of any good divide and conquer solution. And then we have to combine the results. So in this case, we're going to get the max of the left hand side and the max of the right hand side. And then the max of the whole thing is just whichever of those two numbers is larger. So we don't have to merge anything because we're not doing sorting, but this is like the um, combination, I guess the conquer part of divide and conquer. So in, in the case of merge, you really literally combine things by meshing them together for merge sort. But uh, here we just have to get the single number that's the max of the left-hand side, single number that's the max of the right, and then take the larger of the two. Now the question is, what is the running time here? So this, this works. It seems like it's an interesting, cool idea. It's different than the for loop algorithm. Um, and, but it's not obvious if it's going to be better or worse or what um, compared to the original. So we have to write a recurrence. We're going to get good at writing recurrences because it allows us to use fancy algorithm techniques like this. So we'll have a base case uh, that we just do a constant amount of work to return the first thing. And otherwise, what do we have here? Well, we have a constant amount of work here to just say which one of those two numbers is the largest. And then I'm going to assume that we can split the array in halves without incurring a linear cost to copy things. And in that case, it's really just going to be the two recursive calls plus a constant amount of extra work. So we can write that as one plus two times t of n over two. Now let's think about how this solves out. So we have t of n equals one plus two t of n over two. Now let's substitute into here. So that two t of n over two will get replaced with uh, another one plus two times t of n over four. And when we expand that out, it becomes one plus two plus four t of n over four. And then if we do that same idea again for four t of n over four, that's going to get replaced with 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 t of n over 8. And then we can continue this process. And what you should notice is that we have a decreasing series, uh, an increasing series of powers of 2. And now the question is, how high does it go? Well, we're dividing n by 2 every time, which means that because we're dividing by 2 every time, that means that we're only going to have to go to log base two of n levels. And so what we will ultimately get from this is one plus two plus four plus eight up to two to the log base two of n. Well, this two to the log base two of n is just n itself. That's the property of logarithms. 
And then we've certainly mentioned this kind of sum, it's called a geometric series of powers of two. And what you should remember is that when you have a sum of powers of two, it's always the next power of two minus one. So this summation actually just equals two n minus one, which means that this whole algorithm is big theta of n running time. So what do we make of that? Well, what we have is the divide and conquer algorithm, which isn't really anything better than the standard for loop approach would be. And the reason to show you this is to get a little more practice with recurrences and thinking about divide and conquer. There's nothing wrong with what we did. It's just to remind us that divide and conquer isn't going to magically make every problem better. It can give you big benefits for some kinds of problems, but sometimes you can apply the technique and it just doesn't really give you any improvement. And this is one of those cases where uh, it seems like we came up with a different sophisticated way to solve, to find the max of a list. But in fact, we just essentially did the same steps of looking through the whole array just in a different order and making more work for ourselves and for the computer with the recursive calls. So thinking back to sorting algorithms, there's a couple of points that I think are useful to focus on when we're comparing sorting algorithms, um, which are stability and space. So we've talked about speed a lot so far, but what about these other two things? So stability, that's a subtle topic, but in, in a stable algorithm means uh, it has to do with the relative ordering of equal elements. So if I'm just sorting numbers, it doesn't matter. Um, so if I'm sorting like 2, 1, 2, 8, 1, to uh, seven. If I were just sorting these numbers as numbers, we don't care if this two gets moved relative to the other twos, you know, it's gonna be one, two, 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 seven, eight, regardless, and I don't care which two is two, because they're all just twos. But a lot of times what's happening is you have some numbers, but then they're attached with some other information. Um, so there might be I don't know, there's a red box associated with this two, there's a triangle associated with this two, and a star associated with that one. Someone just rang my doorbell. And when we sort them, what we would like is that they stay in that same relative order. So if they do, that means that we have a stable sort algorithm. So items that have the same key stay in the same relative order. Why is that useful? So think, for example, if you're sorting by first and last name, you might first do a sorting algorithm by first names and then do a second sorting algorithm by last names. And what you'd like is that the first names of people with the same last name are, are in the correct relative order. So that's what you're going to get from a stable sorting algorithm. And it's useful to think about what algorithms we've seen so far are stable. Uh, many of them are. So insertion sort and selection sort both can be made to be stable if you get the um, less than or equal to conditions right but it's not hard to figure that out and make sure that those are stable and merge sort is also stable as well as long as we always prefer elements on the left hand side when we're merging so when you're merging and you compare if the fronts of your, if, if index i in the one list and index j in the other one, if they're the same, you should always take index i from the first list and now you have a stable sorting algorithm. What's unstable? Well, what's less left out of this is heap sort. And if you think about it, it's because when you're doing heap sort, you're building this heap and moving things all around in the array. And so you could have two things which are like close together originally in the array and they just get moved to totally different parts in this heap structure. And, uh, and then they, they end up in different relative orders at the end. Um, so that's, that's kind of an issue. For some applications, you don't care, it doesn't matter, but sometimes you do. The other question here is space. Uh, and that's another interesting one. So we'll talk about the space of merge sort in a moment. But the big question with sorting is, is it in place or is it not in place? So in place means that you're only swapping numbers around. So you don't have to allocate any extra arrays in order to sort your list. And a lot of things are in place. So insertion sort, selection sort, and also heap sort. 
One of the cool properties of heap sort is that you can build the heap in the place of the array and then remove from the heap and just swap things around. It's, it's very cool. It's a very powerful idea. Not in place means that we have to allocate some extra arrays and, and might lose some efficiency from that. And so that's called out of place. And the only one that we've seen like that was um, merge sort. Because in the, I don't know how my, my word for heap sort here got messed up, but this is supposed to say heap sort. Um, why is merge sort out of place is because you have to allocate some extra space when you're doing the merge step. Um, you have to have your two th sides of the array that you're merging, and then you have to have the out output space, and that's like a different location. And so what we notice is that there's three desirable properties. So stability, like we want it to be stable. Um, um, space, so we want things to be in place. And for speed, you know, we would like things to be big O or big theta of n log n, the fastest sorting algorithms that we've seen, like merge sort and heap sort. And the problem is that there's no algorithm that that's satisfies all three of these. So merge sort is um, stable and it's fast, but it's not in place. Heap sort is fast and it's in place, but heap sort is not stable. Insertion sort and selection sort, what about those? Oh, well, those are both stable and they're in place, but they're slow, they're quadratic time. Um, and that's, uh, there's really no perfect resolution to this. You may be thinking that my next step is to say, and then there's this algorithm that satisfies everything. Unfortunately, there's not. There are in place versions of merge sort, but they tend to really be in, unusable in practice. Um, and so it's almost like, is it really in place though? Uh, and, and, a lot of, and I'm not even sure that it's possible to have them be stable still as well. So that's uh, just an interesting thing. Depending on your application, you might care about any one of these aspects. And then you can choose, you can get two out of the three, but not all three. So the next question we want to ask is, what is the space usage of merge sort actually? Um, so how much extra space do we need at any one time? This is actually a really important question, not just for analyzing the complexity, but also for building uh, efficient implementations. So if you are familiar with you know, C programming and where you're dealing with like low level memory issues that other programming languages, of course, they have the same issues, they just hide it from you. Um, you know that it's more efficient to call uh, malloc a few times with a bigger allocation than it is to call malloc a whole bunch of times with really small allocations. That uh, if you have a lot of calls to malloc and free, that's what's called sometimes thrashing, where you're constantly asking for space from the operating system and then giving it back. And it can really slow down programs that otherwise might be fast. So one thing that uh, efficient algorithm implementers like to do is just allocate space once. So it'd be nice to just allocate my space once, like all the extra space that I'll need. And then as merge sort goes through, maybe some recursive call needs this, and then some recursive call needs that. And then that recursive call returns so it can give it back. And then another recursive call needs that much. And, and if you could just pre-allocate this space at the beginning and then give it back at the end, um, that's much more efficient. So we have to know then how much extra space is going to be used in total through all of the recursive calls of this algorithm. And let's think about um, what the realm of the possibilities could be. So let's just look back up, go back to merge sort. Um, where is extra space used? Well, really the only extra space is, uh, again, <clears throat> assuming that we can split the array without using anything extra, the extra space is really used right here, um, where it's gonna use n amount of extra space to store the result of this merge before it's copied back into the array itself. So within one recursive call, we have n amount of extra space being used. But the question still remains, how much extra space is there total? Because that's one recursive call uses n amount of extra space, but then there's a lot of recursive calls that are all being uh, going on at the same time. You know, that n extra space that you're using in that recursive call 
is separate from the n extra space that some other recursive call can use. So how much um, extra do we need in total? Well, to answer that, we can write a recurrence. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> let me go back. I wanted to say, what's the realm of possibilities? So we know that the first call, like the top level recursive call, not the whole thing, this top level recursive call already uses n extra space. So that's kind of a lower bound on how much extra space the whole thing could use. So that means that there's big omega of n total because you need space for the first recursive call, but you also need stuff for the other ones beyond that. And then an upper bound on extra space is the running time. So if the runtime is n log n, then that means that the space usage is also big O of n log n. Why is that? So in other words, the, the space is always going to be less than or equal to the runtime. And the reason is that um, when you allocate extra space, it takes, a, it takes that amount of time to use it. If you, it wouldn't make sense to have an algorithm that was like ran in n steps, but used n squared space. Well, then you didn't really use n squared space. You only used n because you couldn't write to or read n squared things within that amount of time. So the space usage can never be bigger than what the runtime is. And so that means that we have a gap here. We know that this algorithm uses at least n space, but at most n log n. Uh, so what's it going to be? Well, the really interesting thing with space complexity is we don't have to count the space for however many recursive calls there are. So we can write a recurrence for the space complexity. OK, the um, low level calls just uses a few variables. So that's uh, constant, like, like normal, um, although we could we could probably argue that that's really should be zero, that there's no extra space that we would have to allocate with uh, calic or something or malloc. Um, okay, uh, what about for the higher levels? Well, we know that each recursive call needs n amount of space for itself, plus the space for its own recursive calls. But now what is, what is that gonna be? So think about it. The key idea is that you don't need space, even though there's two recursive calls in merge sort, you only need space for one of them at a time. So I'm claiming that the, the space complexity is n plus t of n over 2. So why not 2t of n over 2? There are two recursive calls, but the point is that when the first recursive call comes back, you don't need that space for it anymore. So the, the idea here is that we can reuse the um, same space for both recursive calls. There's a quote by, ooh, I'm not going to remember their name, but anyway, there's a quote by a famous computer scientist that says, the difference between time and space is that you can't reuse time. Um, you know, so something that happened in the past, you can't go back and like redo that. But if you uh, have just a limited amount of room, you can do something with it, then clear all that crap out of there and do something else with the same room. Uh, you've been living in the same room for some time now, although I think this weekend you're supposed to all move rooms or somebody told me. But um, yeah, so you can live in the same space for a long time, but you can't live in the same time for a long time, uh, if that makes any sense. And the same thing happens with algorithms is that we get to reuse this array space for the both recursive calls. So we just end up with the recurrence like this. And so what does that come out to be? Well, let's solve it. So we have n plus t of n over two that becomes n plus n over 2 plus t of n over 4. And that's going to become n plus n over 2 plus n over 4 plus t of n over 8. And now you can see that it's really just the same pattern all the way down that we're going to get um, n over 4 plus n over 8 plus n over 16 all the way down uh, to one plus zero. And so what we end up with is even though the recurrence looks different, this comes out to the same summation that we saw before. It's the powers of two up to n. So this is going to be two n minus one, which is big theta of n total space. So it turns out that this lower bound um, 
is is matching the big theta bound, not the the upper bound was was a too loose of an estimate. So it uses less space than what the runtime is, um, and that's a property of a lot of divide and conquer or recursive algorithms that they're just going to use as much space as you need for kind of one path of the recursive calls, not for the whole tree at once. And in this case, it gets dominated really by just the space that we need for the very last merge at the top. So if you wanted to allocate all the space that merge sort ever uses at the beginning, you would just allocate one array of like size 2n minus 1, and then let all the recursive calls use different parts of that. Last thing I want to do today is just remind us now we're seeing all these recurrences and we want to we want to get the feel for these things under our belt because it shouldn't be a, a it shouldn't be a hindering block. These recurrences should be like great when we see the th same thing come up again that tells us oh I already know what that is I've already seen that pattern and now I can uh, apply the same analysis and I know what that comes out to be. So let me just write I'm going to write the recursive cases of a few that we've seen. Um, so we, we have seen one plus T of N over two. What is this one? That was from, uh, binary search. And it comes out to be big theta of log of N. We also saw, uh, N plus T of N over two. That's what we just saw as the merge sort space usage. And that comes out to be big theta of n. Um, so all of the, in both of these cases, the t of n over two part, that doesn't contribute a, lot, a whole lot, but in this case, it's the first, the top level n that ends up dominating the whole thing. Okay, what else did we see? We also saw one plus two times t of n over two. So like binary circle where you have two recursive calls, we just saw this in like the divide and conquer max algorithm a couple slides ago. And what did this one come out to be? Well, it turned out to be the same summation as this merge sort space, but just in the other order. So this one is also big theta of n. And then hopefully you can see the picture I'm drawing here. We, we've also seen n plus two times t of n over two, which is like merge sort the time complexity, and that it turns out to be n log n. And so here's four nice recurrences that have to do with um, divide and conquer, where you're dividing things into two parts. And so now we've seen all these different versions. I don't expect you to necessarily remember it, but, but having the facility to know that, wait, I've seen something like that and maybe be able to pick it up or look back in your notes is a useful skill. Um, to at least have some kind of sanity check of does what you're coming up with now make any sense. Okay, and I will leave you with that and look forward to talking to you more next week. Bye-bye.